everyone. I am here with Peter Burns today. He works for In Defense of Christians, and he's actually a Passages alum. Um, and he's going to tell us a little bit today kind of about what he does and also about how we can get involved and um, make a difference. So, Peter, thanks for being with us. Hey, Rachel, thanks for having me. Excited to be here and chat about In Defense of Christians and chat about, you know, Passages and just the, the important work that the organizations do. Awesome, awesome. So Peter, first, I think, can you tell us just a little bit um, about yourself and then kind of about how you got to work at In Defense of Christians, like your path there? Totally. Um, so I am from Southern Illinois and uh, was got involved in politics kind of right out of high school, um, had the opportunity to work kind of for some state representatives in Illinois and then go, um, ended up working for uh, the Rubio presidential campaign, which was an awesome experience. And uh, kindly, uh, finally uh, was actually out in Kansas uh, working for Governor Brownbacks uh, and doing policy in his office, which was the last place I ever imagined myself being. Uh, but that's kind of where uh, the doors open and God kind of landed me out there. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here, but okay. And a year, about a year before that, I had had the opportunity to travel with passages for the first time um, and go, in, go to Israel. Didn't know anything about Israel, didn't know anything about the Middle East. But it was just overwhelmed by what an amazing like country it was, what an amazing part of the world it was, but also just by the really massive challenges that those communities face, and the really you know like just on, on almost every side of the issue, you found there were people suffering and dealing on a daily basis with things that in the United States we never even could conceive of. I mean, the thing that blew me away the first time I was in Israel the most was uh, the fact that actual you know Israelis on a daily basis are dealing with a security threat that is very real and is very personal and they just have learned they just have to live with and that that concept you know is not something that we in the United States even can, can really conceive of and and just seeing those struggles and then seeing also the struggles of the Christian community um, over there was really powerful and so it piqued my interest it got me engaged uh, in a way that I had never been before and so then I had the opportunity uh, to travel uh, with the um, uh, Philos Leadership uh, Institute, and that is an awesome program that partners with uh, passages uh, on some things. I know that you guys, you guys, kind of work together some, which is awesome. They do. They're an awesome organization. Yeah, and so I had the opportunity. So while I was working for the governor, I had the opportunity to do that policy fellowship in the Middle East, and uh, that was really, really powerful. And during that time, I had the uh, we met with uh, Christ, Iraqi Christians uh, who were displaced uh, had to flee ISIS mm -hmm. and were living in Jordan um, and heard the struggles that they had been through. And that was just, you know, that was incredibly powerful to see uh, really what they were dealing with uh, that, you know, they were kind of overlooked by the UN, uh, stuck in Jordan on these weird um, visa issues with like, and it was just, it was, you know, it was, it was a very kind of overwhelming and powerful experience to see that. And then we got to go to refugee camps we got to kind of be in the West Bank and see some of the issues that they face there, the Christian community faces there. And so coming back from that, um, I was, you know, it was, it was, I was like very interested and kind of captivated by the region in a way I never had been. I've never been in foreign policy, never saw myself doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was just very, like, very, you know, uh, intrigued and fascinated in, 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 an, in an amazing way. And I, when I got back, uh, again, kind of got lined up and opened the doors. And uh, Philos connected me with an organization that I now work for called Indefensive Christians. And uh, Indefensive Christians uh, is a DC based advocacy organization that uh, basically is a voice for Christians who suffer persecution and violence for their faith in the Middle East. So we focus on Middle Eastern Christian communities, um, and we look for specific policy solutions for those communities uh, that the U.S. can implement. And often those communities do not have a voice in the region. Often they're, they, if you look at Christians in the Middle East, they're usually very small minorities. Mm -hmm. And they usually don't, you know, uh, what you see is you see kind of the region the religious factions in the region, the Sunni religious factions usually have Saudi Arabia that kind of has their back. The Shia religious factions usually have Iran that kind of has their back. And then the Christian community usually doesn't really have much of anyone. Uh, and so it's often that the, uh, we see them kind of fall through the cracks. And so it was, you know, uh, at IDC, we look and we, see, and we look and we know that, uh, you know, for many uh, people in the States, uh, protecting religious freedom is a core value and just human rights and avoiding, you know, just 
human uh, human suffering and uh, genocide and you know hum- uh, atrocities is, is an important thing to a lot of people in the states mm-hmm. and so we look at that as kind of a, a core in, uh, actually like a national interest uh, and then we we try and uh, through that uh, develop policies that will be beneficial for the Christian communities in the region and uh, the end ways that Congress can engage and the State Department can engage and the administration can engage. No, that was really cool. So Peter, uh, you are located in DC. I've, I've been to your office and you're only a couple blocks from the Capitol building. Yeah. Uh, it's beautiful. You have a great view when you walk outside and uh, Union Station is just right across the way. Um, so what is it like working on Capitol Hill and what does that mean for in defense of Christians? What exactly do you do on Capitol Hill and what does that kind of look like for you guys? Yeah, well, you're, you're right. We're really blessed to have a really great location. Uh, it makes it super convenient, especially for my job as I do, I do kind of our government relations portfolio, which means I'm, I, all the time I'm going over to, uh, the Senate and House office buildings to meet with, uh, staffers. Uh, for members of Congress and for senators to discuss these issues. So IDC, we uh, kind of see ourselves as a puzzle piece that fits in between uh, the elected official and their staff and the kind of the think tank world. Uh, the think tank world is very academic and develops a huge amount of really important research and, pol- and like uh, kind of policy ideas and really understands issues in a way that, you know, staffers on the Hill, they have to cover a, a hundred issues or not a hundred, but they have to cover, you know, staffer on the Hill will have four or five issues they have to cover where someone at a think tank will spend their entire career focused on one issue. So these are really, really, really just, you know, great experts. Um, But then, you know, often there can be a disconnect though when they'll write a, you know, a hundred page policy paper on, you know, what to do about, you know, uh, religious persecution. Yeah. And the the staffer doesn't have time, you know, in his like between the 10, 20 other meetings he has to do that day with other constituencies to sit down and read that 20 page policy paper. So what we'll try and do is we'll try and say, okay, you know, what specific things could, we'll go to the member and we'll say, do you, you know, we'll find a member's office where they say, man, we really care about Christians. We really don't, uh, we really believe in religious freedom. We think that's a core right. And we think there's a, you know, a U.S., you know, we have a responsibility to be engaged on that issue. And we'll say, how can we help you? How can we help you engage? What would you, you know, there are these, this is, you know, there's legislation you could uh, co-sponsor there. You could put, put forward a bill yourself. We can help you, you know, develop an op-ed on the issue. We can, you know, so our office tries to step in and be that uh, kind of that puzzle piece between the, the information and then the actual action taken by the elected officials. And another thing that IDC does is we try and take uh, diaspora communities in the United States. So uh, this is kind of the other, maybe the other branch of our organization. Uh, reaches out to like diaspora churches and people who have family in the Middle East still. We try and engage them because many of, many of them are more recent to the United States and they don't come from countries where there is a political process like the U.S. So they're not used to being engaged in that way. Mm-hmm. So we will reach out to them and say, hey, you can call your member of Congress and, you know, tell them what you think about this. Um, or you can write them a letter. Or you can come have a meeting with them. And they will, you know, that, that will, that's important. To them. They want to hear from you. And so we try and engage them in that way, too, because they, they, they're really the community in the United States that, uh, you know, they still have aunts, uncles, they have brothers and sisters and cousins who were killed by ISIS. They're the one. This is like this is for them. This is their life. These issues are, are, are these issues aren't just important. They don't just care about these issues in a humanitarian religious sense. They care about these issues in a personal sense. So. No, that is so cool. I did not realize you did. That was part of your organization. That's really neat. Um, so can you tell us maybe just like a few things that we need to be aware of about what's happening with Christians in the Middle East. So this is kind of your area of expertise, but yeah. give us just a couple things, two or three, that we that we really should be aware of that maybe we aren't, um, but that's really important. Yes, totally. Um, so IDC was founded actually in response uh, kind of to the rising uh, uh, violence towards the Christian community in the Middle East. Uh, specifically um, in Iraq and Syria with ISIS. So ISIS kind of created, formed its caliphate in northern Iraq and Syria. And part of northern Iraq is called the Nineveh Plain. And that area uh, was a historically Christian region with a lot of Christian towns and Christian communities. And so when ISIS formed its caliphate, they went through and they devastated that region. Uh, and the Christians had to flee. Many, many were killed. The Yazidis also lived in that region, and the Yazidis also had to flee. Again, many of them were killed by ISIS, 
Um, many uh, Yazidi and Christian girls were taken into sex slavery by ISIS. Their towns were burned. ISIS came in and literally wanted to wipe them out. They would go in and they would blow up, you know, power stations. They would destroy water, the, you know, sewage systems. They would rip up farm fields. They did anything they could to try and destroy the region so they could never come back. And then they just kind of indiscriminately killed people. And, you know, not to be grotesque, but like they were, like they were very, very brutal. Um, uh, one story that is just, I think, you know, demonstrates the brutality was, uh, they kidnapped uh, Christian couples, uh, two daughters, and the next day they brought them back in, in, in trash bags, uh, their body parts back in trash bags, and left them outside the Christian couple's front door. And, uh, and then they, left, they also left a video recording of them, of them killing their daughters. Um, this is the kind of really just twisted, evil, brutal things that the Christian community there suffered um, in the animal plane and in Syria. So, um, a big part of what IDC did in the beginning, what we were formed to do, and we're only a four-year-old organization, so we're pretty new uh, to the scene of, you know, we're not, we haven't been around 50 years or something. Um, a big part of what we initially did, and even before I came on board, was we were working towards getting uh, a designation of genocide uh, towards the Christian community uh, in Iraq and Syria, an ISIS genocide designation from the State Department. And the reason that was important is because once someone is a victim of genocide, the international law treats them differently and they get special rights and protections that you don't otherwise get. Okay. So that was a really, really big success working with partners in, in Congress and working with the State Department that under, under Actress Secretary Kerry on um, the last administration, there finally was a designation of genocide against Yazidis and Christians in the Nineveh Plain and uh, Sinjar, which was a really, really big deal. And um, so that was, a, that was kind of the, the first thing, kind of first push. Um, and then from that now, uh, kind of down the road, uh, the next thing, now ISIS is pretty much defeated. And now uh, the, the goal is to help these Christian communities return to their homes. And these are these, you know, the Christian communities in Northern Iraq. Um, actually, many of them predate the Catholic Church. <laughs> they're, many, some of them are Catholic. They're, they're Chaldean, they're Assyriac, they're uh, Assyrian. Um, and uh, all those can be, you know, can be Orthodox or Catholic. Um, but Many of them actually were, these communities were started, these towns, these became Christian towns before the Catholic Church, and actually before even Islam was uh, mm -hmm. founded. So these are ancient, ancient communities that have been destroyed, and the goal right now is to try and get, like, rebuild the infrastructure and allow these families to return home uh, to the, their homes in the Nunavut Plain. And so we've had the opportunity to work with USAID, and actually the vice president, it was very exciting, the vice president last fall spoke at a banquet we put on. And he announced that USAID would be putting out uh, new funding to help rebuild this area. So even just last week uh, in Baghdad, they had a conference where they brought a bunch of entrepreneurs and uh, business startup, uh, you know, kind of thinkers and humanitarians and foreign aid groups together in Baghdad. And they said, you know, we have this USAID funding and they proposed projects uh, for the Nineveh Plain to start rebuilding and kind of allowing that community to start returning. That, and that has been a big, big focus of, uh, of what IDC has done. A lot of our policy work, a lot of our advocacy has been focused on that. And there is still a legislative aspect of that that I can share about in a minute. But then another, um, another major kind of thing that I think, you know, it's, it's helpful to understand about, you know, I think you were asking kind of what, like, just to reiterate the question, what, like, kind of th few things are important to know about Christians in the Middle East. Yeah. That's, been one of, that's been one of the biggest issues. Another thing that's really... Uh, you know, I think it's, it's getting more attention now. I think more people are learning about it, but it's starting to kind of just starting to kind of enter into the American consciousness mm -hmm. is, is the Coptic Christian persecution. The Coptic community in Egypt is the, uh, by population, largest community of Christians in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, about 8 million, uh, and they, um, eight to 10, and they're around again, eight to 10% of the Egyptian population. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, uh, they suffer basically systemic persecution within Egypt. Um, if you're a Coptic Christian, uh, all of them at a very young age actually get their wrist. Uh, they get a little cross like tattooed on their wrist. And wow. so they're, that's a kind of an identifier and that's part of their Christian tradition there. Um, and actually it's been used to kind of like target them. And something you see uh, in Egypt is situations where the Egyptian government right now 
uh, is very kind of open, meets with Christian leaders, talks about, you know, the fact that where they're treating Christians really well, things mm-hmm. are going well for Christians, it's a good time you know, to be a Coptic Christian in Egypt. But in reality, that's not 100% the case because on a local level, uh, cops still do not receive fair treatment. They're not equal citizens. An example of this would be uh, a mob uh, a while back uh, grabbed an elderly Coptic woman and drug her into the street, ripped off her clothes, and started beating her up. And the police showed up, and they didn't intervene. And later, when the police were questioned about the fact that they didn't stop this awful thing that was happening, they said, well, it was a big mob. There were just a few of us, and the old lady wasn't going to say anything. And this is fairly, this is fairly normal, um, sadly. Uh, earlier this year, a young uh, Coptic uh, young lady was on the hill at a briefing speaking, and she said, you know, her dad owns a shop, and they, uh, when he's out of the shop and she's watching the shop, uh, a neighbor of theirs, who's kind of a radicalized Islamist gentleman, will come in and threaten to rape her, threaten to kill her, and they'll call the police and tell them about it, and the police will never file a report, they'll never you know, tell the guy he can't cope, he put a restraining order or anything on the, this, uh, this guy. So it's situations like this, uh, another one, and, and you know, they're just, and then there aren't, you know, there's no follow up. The police are not making arrests. Uh, you know, there's not police, c- cases are not opened, trials are not held. And every once in a while, there will be one or two we'll go through eventually. But for the most part, there, there, there really aren't, you know, kind of any, uh, any real action. It's not, there's not a vigorous kind of action taken for these people. And so for Coptic Christians. So that is an area we're focused on. And then the colorful, I mean, the really, you know, colorful, I, colorful is maybe a bad term, but they're really um, uh, maybe news headline catching stuff that happens to them is when they get attacked by ISIS. And ISIS has described Coptic Christians as their, as their what they say, their favorite prey. Because Coptic Christians are not, uh, they're not aggressive people. They're, they're very passive uh, and they will not fight back. They don't believe in fighting back. Um, uh, that's like part of kind of their faith tradition is that they, you know, they don't, they don't, they're not going to like, you know, fight to defend themselves if they're, if they're attacked for their faith. And uh, so, you know, you've seen attacks on churches, uh, attacks on groups of pilgrims, um, traveling to monasteries and things like that. So it's really, it's, it is a very, very tough region for them. And Egypt is a close U.S. ally, so there's an opportunity there. And then another region that I think is important uh, to kind of keep in mind when we're talking about Christians in the Middle East is, is Lebanon. Uh, the Maronite Christian community in Lebanon is proportionally, so not, not, not numerically, but proportionally the largest Christian community in the Middle East. And Lebanon was actually supposed to be a Christian country. So when kind of there was, when the Middle East was sort of redrawn uh, post-World War II, uh, Lebanon was kind of, uh, was going to kind of be the Christian nation in the region. Um, and the, um, Kind of the history there is, uh, I won't go into all the history there, but basically at this point, that's not really the case. And Lebanon is basically a split between kind of Christian uh, Maronites and uh, uh, Shia uh, Muslims. And the kind of the the presence of uh, Iranian influence is really strong there through the military proxy Hezbollah which is kind of has a stated enemy of Israel. This gets very kind of into nitty gritties of geopolitics. But what you end up with is um, Lebanon really faces two really big challenges. One is the presence of Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization that Mm. is basically taking over the country, to be honest. Uh, If they're not stopped, they will. Um, And another is the fact that they have, uh, they're close to every, they're close to being like uh, one in three people uh, being a, a Sunni Syrian refugee who fled the civil war in Syria across the border into Lebanon, which is just an unbelievable. Uh, when you think about this, started you know it, it, from 2011 to today. Uh, if you know, the, imagine the population of even your town, uh, one in three people suddenly being like a foreigner from another country. Uh, I think it would just you know, it just totally it totally changes everything. But especially the thing that it's really throwing off is their their infrastructure it's it's strained to the breaking point mm. even just weird things like road congestion there's not enough there's not enough ro- there's not enough road space for everyone the population exploded in a way that you know no country was ready to handle uh you know uh, their sewage systems their school systems and they've and they've actually lebanon tried to integrate the refugees um at first uh and they've never built refugee camps uh, so refugees kind of live scattered throughout lebanon 
Wow, that's neat. And so that's so there there was a big heart, a kind of a big hearted openness. They wanted to kind of welcome them and say, you know, hey, we'll we'll, we'll help you while you know while there's a civil war going on. But uh, but the, just as the civil wars continued, you have you really see them, you know, you really see just like the the infrastructure of Lebanon strained to the breaking point with just this huge huge influx of refugees. So mm-hmm. that has those issues uh, really have put a lot of stress on the Christian community there in, in Lebanon. And uh, kind of as an organization, we're looking at Lebanon and we're saying, man, should something uh, bad happen in Lebanon? Should, should, you know, a conflict between Israel and Hezbollah break out? You know, should they become destabilized because of this huge uh, refugee presence that they don't have the infrastructure for? Uh, it, would be, it would be very damaging to the Christian community there. Um, so those are kind of issues that, that are really uh, kind of large item issues for us that we're looking at in the region. Okay, so you have, just a kind of like a, a quick summary, so you have, in Iraq, you have ISIS, who's really displaced and destroyed a lot of the Christian communities, and you guys are trying to help them rebuild now that ISIS yeah. has kind of taken a hit and is, is um, mostly yeah. out of Iraq, and then you have yeah. in Egypt, you have the Coptic community, who is, you know, there's eight to ten million of them, but they are struggling because of more of like a systemic, like, the culture there is not friendly towards them. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then Lebanon, which is percentage wise more largely Christian, but um, Hezbollah is really starting to make a big impact there and take over. And then also all the refugees, um, where yeah. you know, the country tries to be big hearted and take them in, but it's just becoming overwhelming. So, what are you guys specifically like on Capitol Hill and how do you guys work with those communities? Um, to kind of in the U.S. make a difference, either through like bills or yeah. things like that. Well, great question. Uh, it's it, our focus is really on how the U.S. can engage positively with these communities and in a way that makes an impact for them. Because as I kind of I think I said earlier, there is there's not really another uh, another nation or you know influencer out there that's kind of taken up their cause in in the same way that the U.S. can and has the ability to. And pardon me, in a lot of ways, the U.S. is really the only, one of the only countries with the, um, the influence uh, to really uh, kind of have their back, have this community's back. And uh, it's, and it's, and it's very, it's, usually gets very complex and into kind of into the weeds um but some of the things we're doing one of the things we're doing uh in Egypt uh well and we'll start with Iraq um as I said we were kind of we were working we worked with USAID uh and with uh kind of the the administration and with Congress to kind of try and push this funding to rebuild and there's actually a bill in the Senate right now that's hopefully going to get a vote maybe even tomorrow um so that's exciting uh that would be exciting would put um, the funding to rebuild in the end of a plane into law. So it would basically say, it would basically say, you know, kind of it would codify the idea that the U.S. is going to help this community return and rebuild. Because right now that's just a directive from the current administration. And in reality, uh, the end of a plane uh, is not going to be kind of it recover from ISIS genocide in the next two years. And beyond two years, politically, we don't know who's going to be in the White House. We don't know who's going to be in Congress. And we don't know that if this is going to be a priority for them like it is for the current administration. Yeah. So we want to make sure that that is in law, on the books, that no matter who's in the White House, no matter who's in Congress, the U.S. is still committed to rebuilding and letting this community kind of regrow uh, and, and, or, or resettle back in their homeland or in their homes. Um, no, that's amazing. So that's important. So we're pushing. That's in the, that's in the Senate. That's very important. We're excited to see that move hopefully very soon. There have been a lot of delays, which have been kind of vexing, but, you know, we meet with a lot of people and work with a lot of offices, and so we kind of just continue to kind of push that, and we're excited to uh, hopefully get to vote soon. Uh, On Egypt, um, there's a bill, a resolution, that basically uh, kind of calls out uh, the Egyptian government and says, hey, look, you're an ally on fighting terrorism. You're an ally, you know, for stability in the region. We give you a lot of foreign aid. But at the end of the day, the way you're treating co- the Coptic community is unacceptable, and we're, we have to you know, hold you to a higher standard. And so what, what we've been, this bill is really good leverage because the Egyptian government really dislikes bad press from America uh, mm-hmm. because they get, they get so much foreign aid from us. Um, they're really dependent in a lot of ways. And so they really are very, very, very mm-hmm. conscious of their image in America. So we can use that as leverage. So we work with congressional offices who put forward that bill to, to meet with other staff. So I meet with, you know, a many, many other offices, and I sit down and 
We'll share with them what the resolution is about, what the issue is, educate them on the issue, the, the issues that Coptic Christians are facing. Yeah. And uh, then uh, kind of ask them for their support and get them on board. And as we do that, we also kind of look at, uh, at the same time, using that resolution as leverage, we look at, you know, messaging and work talking with the Egyptian government mm -hmm. themselves about making positive changes in their system and saying, you know, we don't, you know, kind of saying, you know, I know you don't like this resolution. I know this makes you uncomfortable because it's bad press. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to push this resolution if you guys will improve your, the way you treat Coptic Christians, if you'll, mm. you know, if we'll see tangible improvements. Okay. So that's, that's kind of, a, it's a, it's a use, it's like as a lab, it's a point of leverage to, for that yeah, discussion that with the Egyptian government. Um, another thing uh, relating to Lebanon, you know, in Lebanon, uh, like I said, what we're really concerned about is is a conflict between uh, the Lebanese, uh, or well, not the Lebanese, but Hezbollah, and as an Iranian proxy, and Israel. And there's the possibility of that happening is is very real. Um, it's you know, both sides are primed for the conflict. They're ready for the conflict, and they've both kind of messaged that you know, hey, if it comes, we're ready to fight. And what we saw, we saw a couple of weeks ago, a situation where an Iranian drone crossed into Israeli airspace uh, and Israel shot it down and responded with an airstrike into Syria, where the drone was kind of uh, launched from uh, yeah. and st struck the base the drone was launched from. And Syria shot down one of the Israeli fighters that made that airstrike. And so Israel followed up with another airstrike on Syria. So in a matter of hours, you had Iran attacking Israel, Israel attacking Iran, and then Syria shooting at Israel, and then Israel attacking Syria. So, so mm -hmm. you had like in you had three countries suddenly like, and thankfully, thankfully it de-escalated after that. But the the, the escalation just happened in really, really quickly from yeah. a little th a, a comparative not little, but a comparatively um, minor incident of this drone crossing the border. It wasn't like an all-out assault. It was a drone. You know, they sent a drone in, to, and uh, and so our concern is that uh, that something like that could trigger a conflict between Hezbollah and Israel. Mm -hmm. And if that conflict happened. Uh, it would be terrible. It would be devastational for Israel, and it would be devastational for Lebanon and the people of Lebanon, and especially the Christian community. And so, what we're doing is we're looking at ways uh, to try and stave off anything like that. And we see, we think the path forward there is really for the U.S. to engage with Lebanon to try and cut down the influence of Hezbollah hmm. and weaken Hezbollah, uh, so they're no longer a major player in the Lebanese government and the Lebanese political system and power structure. Mm -hmm. And then bolster the the legitimacy of the official Le of the actual Le Lebanese government. Uh, so this kind of this militia Iranian proxy is no longer kind of mm -hmm. the power behind the throne, and the and the actual Lebanese government has the power again to assert itself. Um, okay. Because the actual like the actual legitimate Lebanese government has no quarrel uh, or is not is not you know trying to pick a fight with Israel. The Hezbollah's mm -hmm. stated purpose is to fight Israel. That's part of their, yeah. their, their core mission statement is that they're there to fight Israel. They're a terrorist organization. So. No, yeah, that's so, working, so we we meet with sorry. I'll just I'll finish with this. We meet with basically uh, every week. I'm meeting with uh, staff uh, in the Senate okay. and, and, and kind of pitching policy ideas. So we're going to them. And we're saying, hey, this is the situation. There's the potential of a war. There's the potential of you know this being a really really bad mm -hmm. situation. Here are some ways that you guys could implement policies that will curb the influence of Hezbollah and will bolster the legitimacy of the Lebanese uh, government. Hmm. Okay. No, that's really interesting. So this has all been like super interesting. It's so informative about what you do and exactly like, you know, what you do, what are the issues, what's going on. Um, so that that's amazing. I'm so glad that there's people doing full time work in this. But what can we do um, as as listeners, as citizens, um, as people who, you know, we don't have jobs specifically in policy? Mm -hmm. um, what are a couple things that maybe we can do? Um, that we're not doing currently? Love that question a lot. <laughs> uh, so there are definitely a few things you can do. Number one, and this is this maybe sounds cliche, um, but it's, it's honestly the truth, is you just ha you have to know about the issue. So right. I, would, I would recommend, you know, if you don't already follow passages, you know, go follow their social media, go follow, uh, I, in defense of Christians, social media, follow us on Facebook or Twitter or wherever you kind of get your social media. Go follow Philos' social media. All three of these organizations put out a lot of great, and maybe you can link us or whatever, link to everyone in the in the For sure, bio, yeah. whatever. Uh, all three of us put out a lot of great. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll share a lot of great content on Christians in the Middle East and the issues that they face and what they're dealing with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And 
just being aware of that, seeing that and following that a little bit will help you because suddenly you'll be able to say, oh gosh, there was an attack on a Christian community. You know, mm -hmm. you might not have known this, but like a couple of weeks ago, an Iraqi family was like all, like a number of them were stabbed to death by like someone who broke into their house. And that was like a terrible thing to happen. But most people don't know about it because it's not going to show up on the nightly news. It's not going to make, you know, make major headlines in the U.S. So by following them, you can even start to be involved in, in understanding and knowing what's going on. And just being informed allows you to be a more, more participate, uh, participate in that way. But then actively, um, it's, this is not hard to do. It sounds daunting, but it's really not hard to do. Look up your local congressman. Call their district office. That's probably within 30 minutes of where you live. Yeah. Hey, next time my congressman is in town, I'd love to sit down with him and talk about an issue that's really important to me. And go in and, and share with them that you really care about Christians in the Middle East. And you don't have to be an expert because they're not experts either on the issue. Share with them what you care about. You know, take in an article uh, that you read that you thought was important that they need to know about. And that is probably the biggest thing you could do. Um, because these issues, they don't have a constituency. They don't, most members of Congress don't think about their constituency carry about, constituency caring about these issues because they think, oh, my constituency cares about, you know, other things like, you know, um, health care and taxes and all those other important, important things. But they never, they never think, oh, my constituency really cares about Christians in the Middle East. You know, that never crosses their mind. Mm -hmm. So having people showing up at their, you know, at their congressman's offices and saying, hey, I'd love to chat with you about Christians in the Middle East. That makes a world of difference. And believe it or not, it's actually not that hard to do. I think it's daunting. And so people don't think of it because it's kind of outside of our comfort zone. But it's really not hard if you, you know, look up your congressman and just give them a, give their local office a call. Um, it's not, it's not that hard to do. So that would be amazing. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's awesome. And it is true. I always tend to be kind of a little intimidated by them, but it's like, you know what? We elected them to serve us and mm -hmm. to um, go advocate for us about what we care about. So yeah. definitely that's a way, totally. you know, they want to hear from us. So that's, that's an easy way. But Total. Peter, Absolutely. I just want to say thank you so much. It has been so interesting to hear about what you guys do at IDC and particularly how you've gotten involved and obviously how knowledgeable you've become. So thank you so much for taking the time um, to come and chat with us today. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Awesome. Well, Rachel, thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure and uh, such a big fan of all you guys are doing at Passages. Keep up the great work and happy to chat anytime. Thanks, Peter.